Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Whitehorse Standing Committee meeting of May 16th. I wish to call the meeting to order. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge and uh, um, uh, acknowledge and uh, show uh, thanks that uh, this evening our meeting is being held on the traditional territories of the Ton Quachin Council and the Kwanlun Dun First Nation. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Can I have a mover, please? So moved. Are, are there any changes or additions to the agenda? Your Worship, there is. Uh, we would like to remove Ron Russo, listed as a delegate for this evening, and add on Ben Hancock, representing the Yukon Breeze Sailing Society. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, any other changes or additions from Council? Uh, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, Councillor Friesen and Councillor Murray are on the telephone this evening. Um, all in favor of the agenda as amended? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, there are no proclamations, so we will move uh, right into our dele dele delegations. First up, we have Sarah Newton from the Climate Caucus. Welcome uh, to uh, City Chambers. We've got a few more people in Chambers this evening as we are slowly sort of moving uh, towards opening up uh, City Chambers, so welcome. Um, we have four delegates this evening, so I'm just gonna do the, um, the interim sort of spiel once so everybody kind of gets that, how sort of the rules work around that. It's not particularly um, onerous, but um, if we can start off by, by saying your name, the neighborhood that you live in, and then uh, you can begin. The lights in the front desk there uh, will show green to go. Uh, yellow it typically will show that you have one minute left, and then red, um, you really need to um, sum it up, um, complete. So you have five minutes. Um, after you are finished, however, please um, don't leave so quickly because uh, some of the counselors may have questions for you. Okay, great, okay, please, um, you're first up. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sarah Newton. I use they, them pronouns. Um, my mother is, of Cape, uh, is from Cape Town, South Africa. My dad's of Western European descent. I live in the neighborhood of Riverdale, and I'd like to acknowledge our, traditional, our, our presence here on the traditional territories of the Kwanlin Dun and Tan Chan Council. I'm working with the Climate Reality Project as the Regional Engagement Coordinator for Northern Canada. And I'm also working as a research assistant under the Northern Energy Innovation Center at Yukon Research Center. Um, I just want to quickly run over some of the programs that the Climate Reality Project is doing. And my purpose today here is to invite the elected officials to join the Climate Caucus. Um, and to inform you about uh, some exciting initiatives that we have going on with climate change and climate action. Um, so first off, the Climate Reality Project is an international nonprofit that was founded and is chaired by uh, former Vice President Al Gore of the United States. Um, the primary uh, program is the Climate Leadership Corps, where we train leaders from across the world um, in climate science and how to advocate for climate action within their local governments. Um, the, the second program that we have is the climate, uh, community climate hubs. Um, this is where uh, you come in. Uh, we work with national groups such as the Climate Action Network and the Climate Caucus. Um, the Climate Caucus has just started a northern chapter and they invite any elected official, officials and municipalities to join to share information and collaborate on municipal climate action. Um, we also have a, every year, we put out a National Climate League and I provided some information, a two-pager on uh, the data that was shared with from Whitehorse, Yellowknife, and Iqaluit on uh, municipal climate action. 
Um, I've met with the city staff in sustainability and we have identified that there is a potential to share information in our data sets around uh, monitoring for the city's sustainability plan. So we would like to uh, build just sharing that information with the public and making it accountable um, as far as like taking actions on climate change. Uh, the last uh, program that the Climate Reality Project has is with the Campus Core. So um, this is on campuses across the country. Uh, I've started a sustainability committee at the Yukon University. And in my work with the Research Center, um, I'm going to be working on communications for the Beat the Peak program, which I understand that the City of Whitehorse is a partner with. So we really like to, um, yeah, just increase the amount of people that are signing up for those notifications and increasing awareness around uh, peaks and um, just energy usage in general in our small microgrids across the territory. Um, so just a summary of the Climate Reality Project, we have about 1,650 reality leaders nationally, um, 11,000 acts of leadership, over 4,000 presentations. We have quite a big reach, over almost 700. 700,000 participants in some of our events. Um, we also put out uh, communications newsletters nationally and um, have uh, quite a big reach with our website and even international. So my purpose in uh, being as a Northern Regional Engagement Coordinator, I am trying to elevate the actions and climate leadership that's already happening in our Northern communities, especially Indigenous leadership in climate action. I'm networking with all the relevant or organizations that are already working on climate change. And um, yeah, we're looking to recruit more, more people to take action in, in leadership. And I'd like to acknowledge the leadership that City of Whitehorse has already been taking on climate change. And I am happy and excited to work towards doing better. So thank you very much for the chance to share this information with you. And I welcome any questions. Thank you very much for that. And also, thank you for the, the, I don't think they call it slide anymore, but the slide presentation. Yeah. Uh, any, any questions? Councillor Cadeno. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. I, I've actually got two through you. Um, my first question is, uh, who is actually funding the program? And the second is, what are the time commitments and expectations if an official were to chomp we're interested in joining the Climate Caucus? Uh, those are great questions. Um, I know the Climate Reality Project, my position here, is funded by the federal government, their Climate Action Fund, the CAF funding that they had. Um, with Climate Caucus, I think that I'm actually not fully sure what the time commitment is. I, I think it's uh, like two to four hours a month, but that's just a a bit of a guess. Um, Councillor Steve Roddick, to the former Councillor Steve Roddick, was a part of the Climate Caucus in the past. So. Just to follow up, Your Worship. Mm -hmm. So the Climate Caucus, it's an exchange of information. Is that what they do there? Yeah, and they are yeah exchanging information between municipalities about like what's working with climate action, um, different ways um, in all the different areas that you can start making making changes or advocating for. Um, yeah, policies that will help reduce emissions. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone on the on the phone? Um, Councillor Cameron, did you have a question, please? Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship, and uh, thank you so much for coming and presenting to us this evening. Uh, you probably are aware that in our strategic priorities, matters relating to climate change are front and center, mm -hmm. floods and fire. And of course, recently, you're probably aware of the slide down the, um, what used to be called the South Access. These are all related to significant changes in our environment, and we have to be particularly aware of these matters. So I really do appreciate your time coming to us and the work that you're doing. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Uh, just a question. So is, is, the, um, is the national director, is that Alex Lidstone? Is it the same group? 
with the climate caucus. Yeah. I would have to look that up, actually. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Because I think uh, I am a member of the climate caucus, and I'm just wondering if uh, there's a different one, but it might uh, might not be. I, th I think she's more on the national basis, and maybe, Sarah, you're the, uh, the more regional rep. Yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm not working with directly with Climate Caucus. Uh, they're a partner organization with Climate Reality Project. So I was uh, part of the Northern Chapter meeting last week and just wanted to raise awareness and attention to, the, to this group. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, and as Councillor Cameron said, this is perfect timing. We've just passed our strategic priorities and um, uh, climate change and at a adaptability and resiliency is is on our on our to-do list for sure thank you very much thank you very much have a good evening uh, next up is whitehorse uh, woofers Just uh, making sure the space is clean. Um, good evening, welcome. I know one of you. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll let you um, again do the introductions and then uh, get started. Okay, a bit hard to follow a climate change presentation, but uh, anyway, my name is Val Lowen I, uh, and uh, I'm here representing Whitehorse Woofers and I have here my, uh, Carol Foster. And I live in Crestview, and she lives on the Hot Springs Road. <laughs> oh, I have to press the button. Not that button. So um, we have two little requests for you this evening. One is that the city recognize that um, dog sports are a le legitimate form of recreation. And secondly, some po hopefully some assistance in, um, in re replacing or restoring our lost uh, training facilities. So who are White Horse Woofers? We're a club formed in 1996. We have about 25 members. We typically run four to six uh, agility classes per week with um, five to six students per class. And we also run rally classes. We currently have a wait list of, of about 25 people who want to do um, in, in beginner agility. Um, our classes are taught by experienced volunteers. Uh, the fees that we charge are to cover the cost of renting the space, buying new equipment and running events. Um, and the events that we typically host are agility clinics and trials, rally and obedience classes and trials, and nose work clinics and trials. So, um, our club has been training in the Zucchini Arena, Mezzanine, and the designated dog field behind the arena for at least 13 years. This winter, we received a letter from the city stating that beginning in 2023, Zucchini Arena would be undergoing significant renovations and that Quote, 2021-22 will be the final season that dog handlers will be permitted to utilize indoor space at this location. And further that, quote, we are unable to confirm whether the upcoming renovations will impact the use of outdoor training space and storage. Um, we were not told the nature of the renovations, but if both of those things happen, it pretty much kiboshes our activities. So a little history. Some of you may recall that in 2012, we were told that dog groups could no longer use the MEZ due to a policy of no dogs allowed in city buildings. Undefined health issues were cited as the reason. We did try to find alternative space with the help of a city staff person, but were unsuccessful. Thankfully, the city allowed the, our club to continue to use the MEZ for our activities. 
So really the issues for us are we need a relatively large space to do agility. Much smaller than the MES is really not doable. We need a place to store equipment. We need a space that is affordable to a nonprofit that would use the space for 10 to 12 hours per week. We need a fenced area in the summer that is large enough to hold competitions, so something like 120 by 120 feet. So some of the options that you might like to suggest are that we rent space from the local dog businesses or that we rent space from the local horse arenas. Um, the problem um, with the dog businesses is their spaces are fairly small. One of them is maybe slightly doable, but the main issue is that they want to use their space at the same time that we would want to use their space, which is essentially weekday evenings. So the, they want to hold classes when we would want to hold classes. Um, in terms of the horse arenas, they want to use their arenas for horses. And we have in the past actually used the arenas a couple of times, but um, in recently in the last few years they've really stopped answering our email. So I guess that's not going to work. So dogs, dogs, dogs. Dogs, as you know, are pretty popular in Whitehorse. Um, I think that dogs that are trained are happier, healthier, and cause less problems to the city. On a personal note, I love agility, and um, I've been doing it over for over 10 years. <clears throat> I also love white horse and don't really want to leave, but um, um, that little dog there on the picture, I just got a couple of years ago and was hoping to do agility with him for the foreseeable future. Um, on, and on a final note, uh, the Yukon Schutzhund Association, which I cannot say, <laughs> um, also used the MES this past winter and um, needs also kind of the kind of space that, that the MES offers, so there are potential partnership opportunities with them. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Any questions from the phone? I have a question. This is uh, Councillor Murray. Yep, please go ahead. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And I do note um, that you had worked with the city staff on looking at alternative spaces. Um, were there any other organizations or even um, or government organizations like YG about using other potential fields uh, outdoor and any other spaces you've looked at uh, for indoors. Thanks. We, we haven't really looked for outdoor yet. Um, one thing you guys could do if you're really going to take it away from us is to give us the fencing. Um, the, but in terms of indoor, we have looked at a few options, but it, it is really hard because we need a big empty space that has storage and with proper flooring and that nobody else kind of wants to use when we want to use it. So we can't have a lot of stuff on it and we can't really afford commercial rates. Could I ask you guys a question? What is happening at the Takini Arena? Yeah, um, somebody might be able to get back to you on that, but but this, this forum is more for us to, to ask you questions. Um, but uh, your question is noted. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll uh, I'll ask administration to, to get back to you on that. Um, there are plans to, to do renovations there for sure. Um, my question is, yeah, have you, have you looked at other um, potential funding uh, opportunities? I, I don't know with, and I'm not passing the buck here, but with uh, Yukon government or, 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 or other agencies? I don't know what would be possible for a sort of a long-term um, opportunity for that. Um, we can try and look into it, but we haven't had funding in the past. Um, yeah, no, we yeah years. we haven't had funding in the past, and we have we have paid for the use of the facilities. So yes, okay, all right. Um, any other questions? I don't see any, so thank you very much. Thank you also for the presentation, and uh, we'll make sure that someone uh, gets back to you. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks for your consideration. Yes, thank you. Next up is um, Matthew Trickett.
Um, good evening, and I know that you've been here before, uh, Matthew Trickett, so uh, I'll just uh, let you um, start. Perfect. Thanks. I just got a couple of thoughts I've written down here. Um, good evening, City Council. Thanks for having me here today. I'm going to be talking about the controversial topic of climate change. Um, we've had many decades of climate predictions, however, exactly zero of them have ever actually come true. If you believe the planet is five and a half billion years old, then it has five and a half billion years of climate data. However, only 120 years of climate data is actually available, um, because we haven't really been, we can't get climate data from billions of years ago. Um, which isn't even a drop of water in a swimming pool. And there's clear contradictions throughout the decades of this so-called data. Here's just a few of them that um, I've quickly um, come across. Oakland Tribune, February 18th, 1925. Arctic turning warmer, glaciers melting. Washington Post, January 11th, 1970. Colder winters held a new dawn ice age. Some of, some of them say the world is in a cold snap that started in 1950, which could last hundreds of years, bringing on the start of another ice age. And then we jump to 1989, June 12th, from the Associated Press. UN predicts disaster if global warming is not checked. A UN environmental official say entire nations could be wiped off the face of the earth by rising sea levels if global warming trend is not reversed by the year 2000. So, as you can see, there seems to be decades of um, mispredictions, but uh, you know, at this point, they're going to have to be considered lies. Uh, fear mongering has gone too far into this climate cult, and it simply needs to stop. As for me, it seems to be based on baseless science, which are, seem to be missed. There are hundreds of different kinds of weather, modification, weather, weather modification patents available. And I'm sure if you know uh, by now, we have a weather modification um, act in this country, which allows the government to, um, weather modification activity includes any action designed or intended to produce by physical or chemical means changes in the composition or dynamics of the atmosphere for the purpose of increasing, decreasing, or redistributing precipitation, decreasing or suppressing hail or lightning or dissipating fog or cloud. So this is kind of shocking for people that wouldn't even know that this exists. So a couple of questions that you know, come straight to my mind would be, what kind of chemicals are being used? How do these chemicals affect the air, water, and soil? How do these chemicals affect humans and animals? And if the government is already admitting it can create weather, then in theory, we can have perfect years with zero chance of bad weather, effectively reversing climate change as we know it. <coughs> so if the city cared about the environment as much as they claim, there's a few simple, mm, a few simple things that they could do immediately. Um, so banning the sales of all carcinogenic chemicals based herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides within the city jurisdiction. Stop applying to host meaningless winter games. And this, this is a good one, actually. Um, the Christmas lights are on all three months for um, three months straight. And last I heard, there was over 800,000 LED lights. And then also, the city of Whitehorse is even encouraging citizens to light up their own house and even go on tours to watch other people light up their own house. That's mind-boggling and very contradicting. Um, we could also stop painting those sidewalks in rainbows, quarter-inch thick, for all of it just to wash away, end up in the rivers. You might as well just dump 50 gallons of paint in the Yukon River. <clears throat> and so, um, another question that I've kind of thought is, um, the carbon footprint of this new battery station going in. Um, you know, battery mining is definitely very, very dirty and, uh, and oftentimes is associated with child labor. Um, it also takes eight years for a Tesla to equal the CO2 output of a similar sized car. And that's from, you know, production onwards day one to eight years from now. <clears throat> so, um, I know we're installing other things, but. $35 million worth of batteries, it'd be interesting to know what the carbon footprint of installing all those batteries is actually going to be. I'm just going to wrap this up. We've got 10 seconds here. 
A um, couple local failed predictions is um, last year, it was described as a one in a hundred year flooding that happened. Turns out we had more snow this year. So now your one in a hundred prediction has turned into one in 50 very quickly. And the landslide that just happened. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you to s sum it up there, Mr. Trickett, please. Sure, yeah, last one. And landslide that just happened, blaming climate change. Um, it's kind of odd, I mean, landslides, you'd think it'd be happening long before humans and will continue long after humans. So it's, that's what I'm just going to say for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions for the delegate this evening? Anyone on the telephone? Okay. Thank you again. Thanks. Uh, our last uh, delegate this evening is Ben Hancock from Yukon Breeze Sailing Society. Ben Hancock from Porter Creek, uh, representing Yukon Breeze Sailing Society. Um, our proposal refers to the amendment of our license of occupation on the Swatka Lake. I'm um, also joined here by Albert Farrow from Carcross and Neil Hawkes from Hillcrest. Um, if you can see our presentation, uh, I'm trying to check, I've got the first slide. Yeah, there we go. First slide, uh, this is a photo of the kids' camp, which is part of our core business. So um, I'm going to be uh, going through this in four elements. The first one is what is Yukon Breeze Sailing Society? The next one is what is our proposal? Then what is the benefit of our proposal? And what is the impact if the proposal is not approved? So Yukon Breeze Sailing Society, um, it's the Yukon's only sailing society established in about 2011. Um, it's the only opportunity for people who sail um, but don't own boats. Uh, it provides kid camps, uh, drop-in sailing, regattas, and adult lessons. It's based at Swatka Lake with a license of occupation on the East Shore. Um, and its intent is to provide sailing opportunities to all Yukoners at minimal cost. Uh, and it has subsidized programming uh, with, in order to minimize fiscal barriers for people to get into sailing as a sport. Um, these photos here uh, show the setup that we currently have on Swatka Lake. Um, with the laser boats um, and the shipping containers visible in the bottom right photo. What is our proposal? Um, so Yukon Breed Sailing Society was granted funds from both Community Development Fund and also the Lotteries Yukon. Um, this was thanks to uh, kind letters of support from the previous mayor and the current mayor and also Flatwater North, uh, a canoe society who operate on Swatka Lake, uh, a float plane operator and members of the sailing community. Uh, this funding is to allow us to invest in two-person boats. Uh, these allow adult lessons for complete beginners. Uh, currently, with the only one-person boats, uh, it's quite nerve-wracking for someone to get into a sailing boat uh, on their own um, to, to try and sail across a lake. Um, these two-person boats are also used by universities, and so it would allow Yukon youth to develop the skills to then be able to compete at university level. Uh, the funding is also for a second safety boat in order to ensure that the learning that we're conducting is in line with Sail Canada guidance. And the funding also then provides uh, storage for the boats on the shore. Um, so this is intended to be shipping containers and also a small fenced area for the, a few boats to be stored with the masts up. Um, specifically talking about the fenced area, uh, rigging the mast of a two-person boat takes something of the order of 40 minutes. Um, and that we would then repeat that at the end of using the boat as well. So clearly rigging and de-rigging this of an evening would be very time consuming. Uh, ha the mast is also heavy um, and so lifting it uh, for children would be impossible. And so uh, as I've mentioned, kids camps, it would be extremely difficult for them to rig the sailboat. The photo here shows Neil um, in my driveway yesterday conducting repair work on the new to us two person boats that we've just received. What is the proposal footprint? Um, so on the east shore of Twatka Lake, as I mentioned, we've got these new boats. Um, we've got a, we need to have a secure storage area for them. Um, our intent is to use non-permanent structures uh, with a minimal footprint so that they're minimally invasive. 
um, and intended to be able to just blend into the surrounding environment. Um, and we're suggesting putting murals on the side of these containers with the engagement of local community partners, e.g. schools. Um, we don't anticipate purchasing any more boats or expanding storage facilities as part of our um, plans. Um, specifically, we've selected shipping containers as they're minimally invasive uh, and they don't need any foundations. Um, the layout makes use of the areas that are already level uh, and don't have trees to minimize any tree cutting or earth movements. Um, on this diagram, the yellow areas are the pre-existing with, you can see some shipping containers, a, uh, a toilet and the parking areas, as well as a pontoon, and the blue is proposed of the new shipping containers and a bit of fence. As I've mentioned, it's, to, it's all about the storage that's on site um, so that we can store the boats there over winter and then store them in their in-use format uh, during the summer. Uh, what's the benefit of the proposal? Um, well, so parents and organizers of other youth camps have expressed the need for more camp spots within the city of Whitehorse area. Um, and clearly this camp is uh, teaching uh, youth a new skill. And as I've mentioned, we, uh, we strive to have one spot per session that is subsidized um, in order to lower the threshold for people getting into sailing. We'll also then be able to offer the adult sailing lessons. Um, as I've mentioned, it's much easier to teach someone if you can get them in a boat with you so that you can show them. Um, and we'll be able to offer this programming this summer. And also racing clinics, as I've mentioned, preparing youth for university racing. Uh, then what is the benefit of the proposal? Um, connections to the city planning. The city, rec city recreation plan is in line with actions number 4, 8, 11. Uh, thank you. I've just Sorry. ask you to wrap up a bit there. The red light is on. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then it's also in line with the city sustainability plan. Um, and the final slide, what's the impact if the proposal is not approved? Uh, lower service to the, low, uh, to the Yukon sailing community. Uh, lower inclusivity, and we would then be in a sticky situation having to return funding for the shipping containers, the funding that we've already got, but obviously we can't return the boats. So the conclusion is that uh, this is responding to community needs, and it's in line with the city's planning priorities. It, we're suggesting non-permanent structures, and it's promoting zero carbon emission accessible recreation activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for the delegate this evening? Uh, anyone on the phone? Uh, Council Friesen, I do have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, um, I was just wondering what type of fence would you be using in the area? Um, it's intended to be just a normal wire fence. Um, uh, nothing, uh, nothing too intrusive. And the fenced area is intended to be about of the same scale as a shipping container so that we can simply store the boats with the, the mast up. Thank you. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. If I could pass the chair to the deputy mayor, please. So taken. Yeah, my question was around the fence too. So um, when you say a wire fence, is it like a chain link fence? Yes, that's right, chain link. Okay, and it would be approximately how high, as high as the shipping containers? It would probably be of the order of maybe five foot, six foot high. Okay. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering if, um, the, um, if the club considered uh, actually building a, uh, building a building, um, a wood frame building, uh, similar to the Yukon Canoe and Kayak building that is down on the Yukon River there. Do you know, do you know, have you seen the building that I'm talking about? I'm familiar with the building. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, go we, ahead, please. We discounted a uh, building because that would then require um, kind of foundations and footing and more earthworks, more tree removal than the suggestion of our non-permanent um, shipping containers. Um, we were selecting the shipping containers specifically to minimize environmental impact. Follow up? Uh, nope, thank you. Okay. I'll pass the chair back to you, Your Worship. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Actually, can I ask another question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Um, which um, youth groups do you think that you would reach out to for the murals, and how quickly do you think um, you would start that process? 
Um, I don't know entirely which youth groups. One of our board members is a teacher at one of the local schools, and so we'd be coordinating through her. Um, so it would be in all likelihood uh, via schools um, and also perhaps via the, the youth that are there on the sailing summer camps. But whenever there's no wind, then it's good to have activities for people to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on in the agenda uh, is the Public Health and Safety Committee. I will pass that uh, chair to you, uh, Councillor Cameron. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The Public Health and Safety Committee has one item on the agenda this evening, and that is new business. Does anyone have new business for the Public Health and Safety Committee? Councillor Murray, Councillor Friesen, anything on the phone? Hearing none, uh, Vice Chair, may I turn it over to you? I have one piece of new business, if I may. So taken. Uh, thank you. I wanted to raise uh, a topic of interest to our community. I've been approached um, a number of times in the past uh, week or so about um, some excessive activities in and around the top end of or south end of Porter Creek in the uh, trailways around McIntyre Creek and uni the university area. Um, individuals uh, with very loud, uh, probably illegal uh, motorized vehicles, motorcycles, ATVs and the like uh, that are not only ripping up those uh, trailways, but they're also running uh, down the, the uh, roadways on Pine Street and elsewhere to uh, get access to those trails. Um, I'm just wondering if administration could give us a bit of a briefing on what the plan is for this spring and summer to try and bring those activities in check, um, whether we have anything organized with the RCMP to uh, try and bring those matters under control. If I may pass that on to administration, that would be great. Um, uh, Chair? Chair, I'm City Manager, please. Uh, thank you for the question and uh, through the Chair. Uh, yes, every year at this time of year, um, there are emerging community concerns regarding the use of off-road vehicles in our community, and every year we gear up in our, to make our best efforts to respond accordingly. But I'll call upon uh, Acting Director of Community Services, Krista Morose, to itemize the various uh, measures that we're putting in place. Uh, thank you. Through the Chair, um, I can give you an update on a couple of areas. Uh, bylaw has started uh, monitoring patrols in the area of Tikini, uh, McIntyre Creek, and Porter Creek. Uh, so a file has been generated and staff will be assigned to those uh, patrol times. Um, bylaw services uh, will also be scheduling officers on modified shifts while they work outside of their normal operating hours. Um, and they'll be assigned to the ATV trail patrols. Um, bylaw uh, has not yet reached out to the RCMP. They're going to save that for when they, they need to engage the RCMP. Um, the, working with the Parks Department, uh, they have developed a new motorized multiple-use trail map that will be uploaded for the public to view soon. Um, and in addition to that, uh, it, it helps users to better identify routes, additional trail markings, um, and there will be a small uh, educational campaign that will coincide with the release of that information. Um, just a reminder for the, for the public, uh, the campaign will focus on the rules and regulations for operating within the city, such as operator requirements for ATV. Um, they must have a valid driver's license, registration plate must be attached, insurance, helmet, and have a valid safe ATV card. Um, there'll be information about riding respectfully and sharing the trail with other users. Um, staying on the motorized multiple use trails and then a reminder as to what the operating season is. Um, and in addition, there is a little bit of signage that's going to go at the top of Pine Street, but most of the signage in that area is, is adequate for, for that trail. Um, and I think that's all I have at this time. Follow up, Councillor? Thank you. I'll chair back to you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, Your Worship, that uh, concludes the Public Health and Safety Committee report for this evening. 
Thank you. Next up is the Corporate Services Committee and seeing that um, Councillor Friesen is on the telephone, I'm going to pass that uh, back to you, Councillor Cameron, please, to take us through uh, the Corporate Services Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, this evening there are four items on the agenda for the Corporate Services Committee. Uh, the first is the Fees and Charges Amendment uh, Transit Fares. And uh, City Manager, who would you like to speak to this this evening? Uh, through you, Chair, the presenter for this uh, administrative report will be our Manager of Transit Services, Mr. Jason Bradshaw. Go ahead, sir. Good evening. On April 30th, there was an escarpment slide along Robert Service Way, which was subsequently closed due to safety concerns. Excuse me, but could we get a little closer to the mic? It's, it's hard for me to hear. There, thanks. Sorry about that. On April 30th, there was an escarpment uh, slide along Robert Service Way, which was subsequently closed due to safety concerns. It has remained closed and not expected to reopen uh, until sometime in June. As a result of this closure, uh, traffic has been redirected to use Two Mile Hill, which has increased traffic congestion, uh, which is especially during peak commuter times. Commuters are being encouraged to adjust their travel routes and times, carpool, use active transportation, work from home when possible, and use Whitehorse Transit. In an effort to help mitigate the res resulting congestion and delays, administration is proposing to temporarily suspend transit fees until July 1st, 2022. This temporary action would serve a number of purposes. It would seek to de uh, decrease congestion by increasing the number of transit riders and reduce the number of vehicles on the road. It would encourage transit use for first time riders and for those returning to ride the bus. It would eliminate the potential requirement to fully or partially refund any advanced sales of passes should transit service levels need to be adjusted. For transit passes that have already been sold, such as for May, uh, they would still be usable in July once the city resumes collecting fares. It's administration's recommendation that Council direct that bylaw 2022-21 be brought forward for consideration under the bylaw process. This will allow the amendment of the fees and charges bylaw to suspend the collection of transit fees until July 1st. Thank you very much, Manager Bradshaw. I see Councillor Boyd's hand up. Councillor Boyd. Um, thank you. Um, the one thing that's not in the report and I'm always um, interested in is the expected value of the loss of revenue for, uh, for this plan. Through the chair. Um, difficult to estimate, but I think for the month and a half that we're looking at, we're looking at around 50 to 60,000 in missed revenue. 50 to 60,000? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Councillor Curtanu. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you tell us how we were going to make up those funds? Like, how are we going to, because we technically still have to pay them even though it's free for the riders, how are we going to do that? Um, City Manager? I, I can, uh, I may be able to assist with an answer to this question. Uh, through the Chair, there would be um, a difference between our projected revenues and our actual revenues, and that shortfall would end up coming out of our reserves. Follow-up? Okay. Uh, on the phone, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Murray, any questions for administration? Uh, Councillor Murray here. I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, I think this is a quick comment that I think this is a great opportunity for um, community users to use, community members to use the, the transit. Um, I do notice in the fees and charges manual, um, it doesn't highlight the handy bus services. Is uh, Just wondering if that's uh, included as part of this. Thanks. Manager Bradshaw. Through the chair, uh, yes it would be. Great. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Deputy Mayor Laking. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair. Um, this uh, proposal uh, has the, the suspension of fees until July 1st. Um, uh, as the, we're tying this uh, on, we're, we're moving forward with this because of the slide. I'm wondering if, are we confident that we will have um, the South Access or uh, Robert Service Way open by July 1st? Thank you. Um, manager, oh, city manager. Um, through the chair, uh, I'd like to answer this question by turning to our director of uh, operations to share our projected uh, timelines regarding the road um, as we communicated them late last week. Yes, through the chair, um, we are projecting that the road will remain closed for another three weeks uh, based on the anticipated schedule to uh, clean up the debris as well as install a uh, safety measure uh, to prevent or mitigate against future slides. Do you have a follow-up, Deputy Mayor? No follow-up. Any other questions or comments, uh, Your Worship? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know this. This is encouraging. Uh, we. The fact of the matter is, there's limited things that we can do um, in order to. Um, um, deal with congestion. My question is, um, do we have the capacity uh, in our buses or the number of buses to take on more riders at the peak hours? Because that seems to be peak hours is when the congestion um, is, is really obvious, congestion and delays. So do you have a sense uh, of that, Manager Bradshaw? Through the chair. Uh, I'm not concerned with the capacity during uh, peak times. Uh, during the delays that we've noticed for since the slide, uh, we've been running additional buses to try and help keep us up to schedule. So I, I don't see a concern there. Uh, that's, that's great. Uh, good to hear that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor Kurtanu, did you have your hand up? Actually, the mayor has gotten the question answered. Thank you. Reading each other's minds again. Anyone on the phone? Councillor Friesen, Councillor Murray, anything further? Hearing none, I understand the process is going to be a little bit more streamlined than normal, um, moving this one forward. And as I understand it, we'll be addressing this uh, tonight and again tomorrow to make this move through quickly. Do I have that right, City Manager? Uh, yes, Chair, you have that correct. There will be a special meeting of Council uh, after tonight's committee meeting and then uh, a second special meeting of Council tomorrow at noon in order to accommodate the three readings of the amending bylaw in order to implement this change effective as of Wednesday. Thank you very much, City Manager. Okay, item number two on, the, on tonight's agenda for Corporate Services Committee is budget amendment residential commercial organics and waste carts. And City Manager, who would you like to speak to this? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have our uh, manager, Ira Webb, who, if I'm not mistaken, may be making his first presentation to Council <laughs> tonight. Thank you. Manager Webb. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the issue this evening is um, administration is requesting a budget amendment to the 2022-2025 capital expenditure program to advance the residential and commercial organics and waste carts project from the 2023 fiscal year to the 2022 fiscal year. Uh, a bit of history. <clears throat> the city provides curbside collection of waste and organics to all eligible premises and uh, multifamily units of four units or less. Uh, and also provides organics collection to the commercial sector using our 240 liter waste carts. Uh, the number of carts provided in recent years has continued to increase uh, due to significant uh, population growth and development, continued expansion of the commercial organics program, and replacement of uh, broken and damaged carts when required. Uh, to ensure that waste collection service levels can be maintained, uh, an order of carts is recommended to be made this year rather than the planned project in the 2023 year uh, to prevent a potential shortfall of carts. 
Uh, the last order of carts was uh, received in late 2020. Uh, and current inventory is approximately 240 uh, black waste carts and uh, about 160 organics carts. Uh, given the long lead time on getting carts in, uh, administration is recommending an order be placed this year. Uh, a full load of carts, uh, so a full 53-foot uh, trailer load, um, is recommended as it provides an economy of scale on the shipping costs uh, rather than ordering a half trailer full and paying about the same in shipping. Uh, and we'll provide enough cart inventory to last until 2024 when a new capital request can be submitted. Uh, so the alternatives tonight, uh, number one, amend the capital budget for residential and commercial organics and waste carts or refer the matter back to administration for further analysis. Uh, ensuring that there's a sufficient supply of carts is um, of high importance to ensure that the city is maintaining its uh, waste collection services. Um, as I said, the uh, high levels of development and expansion of the commercial program um, have outpaced uh, department expectations and th thus the need to procure carts sooner. Uh, this project would still be subject to external uh, funding approval through the Can Canada Community Building Fund uh, as it's eligible under the solid waste category as infrastructure to support solid waste management systems. Uh, ensuring sufficient cart supply also supports uh, the city's diversion goals, particularly in the organics uh, stream, uh, by supporting increased separation uh, of organic waste. Uh, so uh, the administrative recommendation this evening is that Council direct the 2022-2025 capital expenditure program be amended by moving the approved budget for residential, commercial, organics, and waste carts, uh, project number 650C-01118, in the amount of $95,000, from 2023 to the 2022 fiscal year. Uh, thank you, Manager Webb. And now do we have questions? I see Deputy Mayor Laking, you're first. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, regarding the order uh, and the reference to the given the long lead time for supplies, I'm wondering what's the approximate estimate that it, uh, uh, for shipping time from when we sip, uh, uh, submit an order? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I believe it's about uh, 60 to 90 days on a full order. Any follow-up? Okay. Anyone else? Councillor Curtanu. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is, there's been a lot of talk in the past about getting more secure carts from animals. Is there any consideration of, of purchasing some of those this time around, or are we just going to go with sort of the status quo? Uh, through the chair, at this time, uh, we still have yet to uh, find a cart that uh, we would recommend um, that is consistently effective uh, in our um, collection system and uh, doesn't it result in significant operational uh, interruptions. So um, we're recommending to stick with the current carts. Um, should be noted too that the majority of uh, wildlife interactions occur on uh, in areas that aren't part of the cart program. So. Uh, at this time, that's why we're uh, recommending our standard carts. Do you have a follow-up? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, on the telephone, Councillor Friesen, Councillor Murray, any questions? Um, Councillor Friesen here. Actually, um, Councillor Cotani just asked my exact question, <laughs> so um, happy to get that answer, but I just wanted to also say um, Thanks to Manager Webb for your first presentation. Good job. You're here. <laughs> Any other questions, uh, Your Worship? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, makes sense to me. It'll, uh, yeah, seems uh, to, to be a, um, a good plan going forward save us some money and save some extra trips, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, my question is on the um, residential commercial. So is it the same organic cart for residential and commercial, the same size, same cart? Yeah, through the chair. Um, in the commercial organics side, we have a large volume and a small volume program. So the small volume uh, commercial organics producers use the same 
uh, waste cart as the residential program, and uh, and then we have a separate uh, large volume two and three yard bins um, that is uh, collected through a contractor. So it's the same size. Um, uh, follow up, Your Worship. Yeah, just um, some of the the comments that I heard um, during um, l last fall was for some of the commercial. Um, operators that have a lot of organics, i.e. the um, places that sell coffee, uh, so a lot of the coffee grinds and stuff, is that uh, there was a concern that the waste carts weren't large enough, and I, I'm not sure if you've, you've heard that, Manager Webb, and if you have, if there's any other alternatives that the city is looking at to, um, uh, to make it more uh, convenient for some of the business owners. Uh, through the chair, um, we do have the option to potentially add um, uh, businesses on the CART program to a larger bin. I don't, I don't know of any specific um, requests recently. Um, I know that the decision on whether or not a business can have a CART or a bin is based on things like accessibility and space uh, at the business, so um, yeah. Any other questions or comments on the phone? Okay, hearing none, this matter will come back to council, I guess, next week. Thank you very much, manager. Well done. The uh, next item on the Corporate Services Committee agenda this evening is a budget amendment range road lift station replacement project. That's quite the mouthful. City Manager, who would you like to speak to this tonight? Uh, Mr. Chair, this will be presented by our Acting Manager of Engineering Services, Michael Abbott. Start. Everything's falling down. Good evening. Uh, the issue before Council tonight is administration's request for a budget amendment for the Rain Ro Range Road lift station replacement project in order to proceed with construction. Uh, a couple references are the capital expenditure program bylaw, our procurement policy, and the Range Road lift station replacement drawing attached to the package. Um, history on this is the sewage lift station and force main on Range Road were constructed in the early 1960s and are at the end of their life cycle. City crews have identified frequent operational problems with this lift station, including security concerns. A proactive replacement of the lift station at this time will be the most more cost effective than future uh, maintenance and upgrades. In 2020, an engineering feasibility assessment was completed for a new lift station by a consulting firm to explore improvement options and determine budgetary costing. The assessment explored three options and determined that the best solution is the full replacement of the lift station with a pre-manufactured wet well and a small building to house the electrical equipment. A preliminary cost estimate of 2.4 million was identified for the project. Detailed design progressed in 2021, and prior to tendering for construction, the pretender estimate determined um, an additional budget of 500,000 was required to complete the project. Council approved this additional budget on February 14th, 2022. The alternatives tonight are to amend the capital budget for the Range Road South lift station project or postpone the project. Uh, the construction project was tendered in March 2022 and one bid was received that was over budget and significantly over the pre-tender estimate. Following the closing of the tender, the city entered into discussions with the sole bidder who is based out of Yellowknife and WT to explore alternatives to reduce the overall cost of the project. Considering the simple design of the lift station, there are no feasible alternatives that would result in any significant cost savings. The bid prices were reviewed in detail and all items of work were within a reasonable deviation to the estimated prices pre-tender, except for the general line item that would include costs for mobilization and demobilization. This is a result of the contractor mobilizing crews and some equipment from Yellowknife. 
Considering the criticality of the sanitary infrastructure and the uncertainty with market conditions in 2023 and beyond, administration recommends proceeding with this project in 2022 and to not delay. The project budget requires an additional 1.5 million to complete it. The additional expenditures are eligible under the Canada Community Building Fund, formerly known as gas tax. So it is administration's recommendation that council direct the 2022 to 2025 capital expenditure program be amended by increasing the budget for the Range Road lift station project in the amount of 1.5 million funded from the capital reserve until an amendment Canada Community Building Fund transfer payment agreement has been approved. Thank you. Thank you for that manager. Uh, Deputy Mayor Laking. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for that presentation. Um, my question was with regard to the, the the original budget, or sorry, the amended budget, and then the additional budget required. Uh, the The request that's coming forward is for an additional 1.5 million. Um, but I, I just note that the difference between the 2022 existing budget and the construction budget is only 1.2 million. So what's the extra $300,000 required for? Thank you. Yeah, through the chair, um, we typically like to have some additional funds beyond just the construction value uh, for small consulting fees, material testing, um, and potentially um, other small project considerations that come up throughout the course of a project that wouldn't warrant um, coming back for, for another budget amendment. Follow up. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the uh, did the previous uh, budget and then amended budget when those um, requests came forward, did those account for uh, the additional um, consulting fees and, and the like that you just referenced uh, um, just now? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, they accounted for a portion, but the majority was for construction. Okay, uh, Councillor Boyd. Um, thank you. Anytime our, but our projects come in um, substantially over budget like this, um, it does make a person wonder whether it's a sign of the times, whether... Um, We've got competitive bids, and in this situation, we've only got the one bid, so we don't know if it's competitive. We don't have anybody to compare to. So that brings up the question of, um, did we reach out to local companies um, and try and find out why they decided or did not uh, bid on the project? Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Manager? Through the chair, yes, uh, we reached out to a number of local building uh, and civil construction contractors. Um, the resounding reason was there's too much work out there this year for them uh, to take on an additional project to be completed this year. Um, that was the main, main reason we heard. Follow up. Uh, thank you. Could, would you be able to share what the value, approximate value of the MOB and DMOB is. And in other words, how much more do we expect that we're paying for this than what we might not normally pay if we had a local company um, doing the work? Yeah, through the chair, with, without, um, out of fairness, without providing a specific number, um, I would say the budget estimate um, was close to what we were expecting. Um, the, the portion that's over for MOB DMOB uh, is a significant part of that difference. Thank you, Councillor Curtanu. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is, uh, this is a lot more money than we were expecting. Are there other projects that the city may have been thinking of earmarking the gas tax fund for that now is either canceled, delayed, or we're just not going to go forward anymore? 
Through the chair, uh, we've had initial discussions on that. There is sufficient funds uh, for this year and projects earmarked for next year, uh, but it is something that we are uh, considering. Um, I don't have specific projects that could or would be pushed out um, in the years, say three, four, five from now, but uh, it is something we've considered. Follow up? Yes, so, so if I understand correctly, that there's potentially some projects that may end up having to be delayed because of it. Uh, through the chair, that's, that's a fair assumption. I mean, we're asking for 1.5 million that would otherwise be allocated elsewhere. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, did you have a comment? Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I am intrigued with the, uh, the answer on why others didn't bid. So your answer um, essentially is that people are too busy, or companies are too busy right now, which means that there are people, are business that, businesses that could bid on it, not this year, potentially next year or the year after. And um, it seemed to me if you got more, more bidders in the game, the, the price tends to be more competitive. So my, my question is, um, is waiting an alternative? Um, or is this something that we must do? And I, I note in the beginning of your report, it, it's the recommendation is it's more cost effective because there's all this maintenance and upgrade going on. But um, is this something that we could put off without uh, um, uh, the danger of it just um, not working completely and really putting us in a bad spot or could it um, sort of limp along for a few more years? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, there's, there's definitely risk both ways. Uh, risk in delaying is we don't know what the market conditions will be six, eight months from now. Uh, we know there is a significant volume of work of this type in the Yukon um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so we could retender and receive bids of equal or greater value. Um, and on the other hand, waiting and doing nothing does risk um, our critical infrastructure to failure at inopportune times requiring emergency funds um, to fix and maintain it at that point. Follow up, Your Worship? Yeah, what, uh, what are we paying on um, maintenance and upgrades? And, and maybe that's um, a, a bit of an unfair question right now, but I think that would be important to know is what would be the cost to maintain it for the next few years and take our chances on um, more contractors in a couple of years? Thank you. Thanks, Your Worship. And so that's a takeaway. If you want to come back to us with an answer at a later point, thanks. Sure. Councillor Boyd, did I see your hand up again? You did. But before we proceed, I believe administration was going to try to answer part of that question. So. Oh, okay. I thought that was a takeaway, but go ahead, manager. Uh, for the chair, I'm going to pass this one to uh, Tracy Allen, director of operations. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, we could uh, definitely probably tease out what we are paying for that uh, uh, or what that particular uh, lift station is costing us in terms of operation and, and maintenance right now. I would say it, it's going to be larger than what we would for a brand new, more energy efficient system. The, the concern, I think the big focus right now is balancing that risk of um, not doing any of the work and not replacing it, uh, it, it for, uh, and con taking into account a, a, a potential failure. Thank you. City Manager. Uh, so just to build on Director Allen's comment, um, we could indeed provide uh, some estimated annual maintenance costs, but we wouldn't be able to estimate unanticipated emergency repair expenses because we have no way of forecasting what uh, those unanticipated emergencies could be. Uh, thanks for that clarification and thanks for the catch, Councillor Boyd. Councillor Boyd, over to you. Um, thank you. Um, Council will need to make a decision on this next week. Um, in order to make that decision, I feel I need to know, I need to better understand the risk potential. 
Um, we only have one bidder. We, it is exceptionally high and the cost, it sounds like much of the cost is because the bidder is from far away. Um, if there's a good chance that we would have more bidders and particularly ones that are closer so we don't have to pay the move and demo costs um, and we could, chances of getting a more competitive or feel like we're getting a more competitive bid would be much uh, would be much greater, but I have to. We do have to weigh that against the uh, the risk. Um, and for me, unfortunately, the language in the in the amend report is it's you know certainly saying there's risk and that, but it's it's not really quantified in any way. And I, so I don't really have a sense of how how much risk we have um, and what is the likelihood that we could maintain this for probably two years. We'd have to be thinking two years if we if we delay right now. So for next week, before I cast my vote, I would like to better understand if we could the the nature of the risk and how other ways we might manage the risk. Um, if it's pump failure, we have spare pumps, put a new pump in. If it's collapse of the of the uh, tank or or whatever it is, well I'm sure you could tell us there's risk of collapse. Um, but I, I think there's, in order for me to make a good decision, I need to better understand that, uh, that risk. So the administration could take that away and think about that for the week and let us know for next week. I would very much appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Councillor Boyd. Uh, City Manager, did you want to take a stab at that or do you want to take it away? Okay take away and come back uh, with this item uh, next week. I'm checking Councillor Friesen, Councillor Murray, anything on the phone? Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Laking. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate uh, Councillor Boyd's comments uh, in addition to the 500 or to the 1.5 million that's being asked for next week we did increase the budget by 500,000 earlier this year which is uh, compared to the um, the 2020 cost estimate that's about an 83 percent increase so I'd like to also have a bit better understanding of what what we're dealing with here thank you thanks for that deputy mayor Okay, I'm seeing no more hands here in the room. Uh, no more on the phone, quickly. Hearing none, okay, so this will be coming back to us next week. And uh, thanks everybody for good questions and uh, good responses. Thanks for all that information. Uh, Your Worship, there's only one other item on the agenda for uh, this committee and that is new business. Does anyone have new business for our Corporate Services Committee? No hands in the room. Councillor Friesen, Councillor Murray, any new business? Hearing none, that concludes uh, our report. Uh, over to you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now moving on to the City Planning Committee. This is a full agenda, so um, over to you, uh, Councillor Boyd. Thank you, Worship. Uh, first item, we have five items, but the first one is public engagement draft official community plan. It's for information only and presented by Melody Samard. Melody, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Council Members. Milid Sma, Manager of Planning and Sustainability Services. I'm here to provide Council and the public with an update um, on the draft Whitehorse 2040 Official Community Plan, specifically the engagement plan for the draft. The Official Community Plan guides decision making for the City by setting the long term vision, guiding principles, and supporting policies for growth and City services. The current OCP was completed in 2010 with various amendments since that time. In November 2018, we launched the official community plan review process, which is called Whitehorse 2040. Since launching the project, there has been a number of studies produced and many opportunities have been provided to the public for public input. 
through various methods, including surveys, open houses, and staff-to-staff -staff engagement with various government partners. I'm happy to share that the draft official community plan is now available for public review on the city's engagement platform. So that is engagewhitehorse.ca. So the official community plan is a document that is adopted by council through a regular bylaw process, but it typically follows a robust uh, public engagement. With that principle in mind, um, the official community plan project team is intending to provide to the community various online and in-person engagement opportunities so that um, members of our community can provide input into the final plan. Um, the, those input sessions um, will be provided during the period of um, starting today, May 16th to June 5th. There will be um, open houses, uh, so two at the Mount Mac Recreation Center, um, so that is May 25th and May 26th from 5 to um, 8 p.m. on each evenings. In addition to that, we'll have a public open house on May 26th, that's at the North Light Innovation Center from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, there is also an online presentation and a public input session that's planned um, on May 31st uh, from 7 to 8.30 p.m. and an online survey on May 6th, uh, starting today uh, um, until June 5th. Online engagement opportunities will also be provided to stakeholders listed on the OCP mailing list and to members of the Yukon Housing Action Plan Implementation Committee. The draft official community plan has also been shared with staff of Yukon Government, Kwanlin Dunn First Nation and the Tan Kwachan Council. Members of the public and stakeholders wishing to receive updates on the project may register on the project's mailing list by emailing ocp at whitehorse.ca. We are intending to advertise broadly our public engagement events, including through social media at various locations throughout the city, um, starting tomorrow at CGC, and then uh, through our mailing list. Following the engagement period, a report will be produced summarizing the public input this report will inform possible changes to the draft, um, which will be brought forward to council for consideration and the bylaw process. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manager Smurd. Uh, questions from council? Councillor Cameron. Uh, thank you, Chair. And two very quick questions. One is, uh, We've got the high-tech options here. I'm just wondering, still possible for citizens to write in and give us their thoughts on the OCP? Second question is, with the bylaw process, what's the kind of the general understanding of just how long it'll be before we'll be through the bylaw process? Thanks. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, through the chair, um, just to respond to the second question, um, so we are intending on concluding the, the, the public engagement early um, June. So after that, we'll take the month of June and early July to consider the public comments, produce a report, and um, write the final draft official community plan. And our hope is to bring uh, the final draft official community plan along with um, the public commentary uh, to count for council's consideration in early August. And after that, um, it's, a, it's quite a um, long um, bylaw um, review process. Um, his official community plan amendments um, do need to um, get reviewed and signed by the minister. So we're projecting that um, the third reading would occur either um, late uh, 2022 or um, early 2023 at the earliest at this point. And then the first question was um, with respect to um, um, 
opportunities other than online opportunities, is that right? Um, we, we have an email, um, ocp at whitehorse.ca, so any comments that we receive through that email, we will definitely c consider those. Um, we do encourage folks to try to um, use the survey as much as possible to um, kind of help us streamline um, um, uh, the comments. So we'll have, um, when we do our uh, community tour, we'll have paper copies of those surveys so folks can also answer it um, that way. And um, we'll also have boards at our open houses where we'll be collecting comments. So we're trying to have different methods um, so that we reach out to um, the community in the most um, broad way possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other councillor leaking. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. My question um, was about the online engagement opportunities for the stakeholders listed in the um, OCP mailing list. Um, what, who, who is on that list, or how do you get on that list? Thank you. Um, through the chair, so this is a list that we've maintained since the beginning of the project. Um, I couldn't list you all the organization because there's um, there's over a hundred um, on that list. Um, if um, organizations um, have not been reached out by us directly in the past, they can email us at OCP um, at whitehorse.ca and we can add them to the list. Follow up. Uh, thank you uh, for that. And regarding those online engagement opportunities, how are those, um, like what's the concept around those? Is that is it just a survey or is there actual engagement like with a, an individual through a Zoom call or, or how are those proposed to work? Thank you. Um, through the chair, um, for the online um, engagement opportunities, there will be presentations um, by either staff or our consulting team and then an opportunity for questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, councillors online, Councillor Murray or Councillor Friesen. Hearing none, well, they might come on yet. Um, I think this is ready. This goes on to council. Sorry, it does go on to council. And it's ready to go to council. Um. Uh, this is yeah. This this presentation is for information only, so it won't be coming back to us uh, next week. No. Okay. So You'll move right into the engagement. Fair enough. This, this does not break our pattern a little bit. Most stuff coming here goes on to council, but this is, stops here for now. And this is uh, quite exciting to see our OCP. It's been in the works, uh, or our draft new OCP, finally making it um, for public uh, review. Finally, yeah, I'm making it there. It's been uh, years of work, and um, so that work was accelerated starting late last year. And um, very pleased to uh, to see today that uh, we've got it. Uh, the lion's share of the heavy lifting has been done, and now um, big issue is to hear from the public and um, see what the public thinks about it. So thank you very much for. Great job um, on this. With that, um, we will move on to our next item, which is public hearing report, zoning amendment, one drift dive, and uh, manager Samard is gonna take us through that one as well, I believe. Yes, that's correct. So the owner, the owners of One uh, Drift Drive in Copper Ridge have applied to rezone their property from RR Restricted Residential Detached to RS Residential Single Detached. Adjacent properties along Drift Drive are also Zone RS. The RR zone only permits single detached housing on service lots. The RS zone permits a broader range of housing options, including duplexes, triplexes, and residential care homes as primary uses and bed and breakfasts, living and garden suites as secondary uses. 
The owners have expressed intent to create a living suite which necessitates necessitates a zone change since living suites are not permitted in the RR zone. A living suite is a separate self-containing dwelling unit within the house, such as a basement apartment. Proposed bylaw 2022-12 received first reading on March 28, 2022. Public hearing notifications were sent out in accordance to the zoning bylaw 2012-20. A public hearing for this item was held on April 25th and no delegates registered for or spoke to the item at the public hearing. One email from the Kwanlin Dunn uh, First Nation Lands and Resource Department was received. Um, this department stated that they had no concern with the rezoning. So the alternatives that are in front of Council tonight are to either proceed with second, um, and, or third reading, second and third reading under the bylaw process or to not proceed. So under analysis, um, one of the council strategic priorities for 2022-2024 is to improve the overall housing supply in the city of Whitehorse. The stated intent of the applicant is to create one living suite which will add to the housing supply in a pre-existing neighborhood of Whitehorse. The administrative recommendation is that council direct bylaw 2022-12, a bylaw to amend the zoning at one drift drive to allow for a living suite be brought forward for second and third reading under the bylaw process. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Smart. Questions, Council? No questions. Thank you very much. I, this seems to be ready to go to Council next week, so that's good. And our next item is the conditional use application, kilometer 1.5 Chavern Lake Ro Road is for information only and Manager Ross is presenting. Go ahead, Manager Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just gonna do a little adjustment here. So this report addresses the uh, proposed conditional use, and it's basically an intensification of an existing Yukon Breeze Sailing Society site at kilometer 1.5, the Chadburn Lake Road. And this was given conditional use approval by council in 2015. This outdoor participant recreation services, as we describe it in the zoning bylaw, is currently established through a Yukon government license of occupation for a 0 0.23 hectare parcel on the east shore of the Chadron Lake, uh, sh uh, sorry, Schwack Lake, and as this area is vacant commissioner's land inside the city. Notice of this application was made to the public on May 6, 2022, with a public input session scheduled for May 24, 2022 at the regular council meeting. Mm -hmm. This outdoor recreational use is generally supported by the city's OCP, zoning bylaw, and the 2017 Chadron Lake Park Management Plan. There are a few items for council's consideration identified in the analysis section of the report before you. And these items were noted through the DRC or the Development Review Committee review of the application. The uh, Development Review Committee noted concerns over visual and aesthetic impacts to this waterfront location in relation to the natural setting that it's in and uh, basically caused by the placement of additional sea cans. Painting of the sea cans with an appropriate color would be a condition of the development permit approval to help mitigate this issue. Parking on the site is accommodated in part immediately adjacent to the license area with overflow parking have having the ability to park beside the Chadburn Lake Road at a location about 200 meters north on the site of the site on the road. There are no titled properties or land dispositions in proximity to the site. However, the site is located in a well-used area of the Chadburn Lake Park and is visible from activity on Schwaka Lake. Administration has noted the need to balance the operational needs of Yukon Breeze Sailing Society with an appropriate scale of development which is suitable to a temporary or non-permanent form of land tenure. 
Initiatives of this nature must also be approved in a manner that allows for fair, equitable, and consistent access to public land. It is noted that while the subject conditional use application proposes the addition of three additional sea can storage containers to the two existing containers and two fenced in secure storage areas, all proposed development is being contained within the limits of the existing license area. And as this is a conditional use report, there's no recommendation at this time. Just note that a public input session is scheduled in accordance with section 4.8 of zoning bylaw 2012-20, um, scheduled for the regular council meeting on May 24th, 2022. Governor Yukon, Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, and the Ta'an Kwachin Council were notified by mail and email a notice of the proposed development was placed in local newspapers on May 6, 2022. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Manager Ross. Um, questions from Council? Councillor Cameron. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a really interesting one for me. It's a, just a quick comment to say I'm really looking forward to the public input on this one. And for the simple reason that on the one hand, this is expanding a recreational activity that's very consistent with this beautiful lake that's inside our city. But at the same time, sea cans are sea cans, and there is an aesthetic question about whether they fit within that uh, overall context. So I'll be really interested to hear what the public has to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Other, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you for this, uh, Manager Ross. Um, do, does the City of Whitehorse have uh, regulations around um, the use of sea cans? Um, through the chair, the sea cans would be considered basically accessory structures in, in most development settings. Um, you know, the zoning bylaw talks about you know, addressing those aesthetic concerns in a residential setting, for instance, we're looking to see that that sea can, if it's arriving on a property, um, has some treatment that makes it complement the principal use residence. Um, I think the approach on the initial approval in 2015 was to see the, the sea cans painted green to blend in with the area, but they are still sea cans and um, this, uh, there's just a bit of a stigma with those as well. Granted, they're a secure storage facility, so there's arguments on both cases. But again, I think it comes back to um, the issue of what's an appropriate scale of development on this site. But uh, the answer to your question is there's no prohibition of these types of things being used in this situation. Follow up? Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, I think you've described it fairly. I, I know in other municipalities, they 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 are regulated because of the um, the um, uh, the the issues around uh, appearance and whether they fit within the environment, whether it's residential or in this more of a for, sort of a wilderness recreational uh, site. I mean, I appreciate that they are a cheaper way of storage, but there is some. I know other municipalities have um, taken a, maybe a little bit more of a, uh, an active stand on them. I'm curious about um, 2015, what the application was in 2015 and specifically and what council um, agreed to. So was the original plan was just two sea cans and uh, now the, the, the society is coming back for three, or, or, or what was it that we were being asked to um, approve in 2015, and did we approve that? Do, do you have that information? And if not, I'm happy to wait for at a later yeah. date. Through the chair, uh, we will confirm it, but just through, through memory, corporate memory, uh, it was basically a, approval of what you see there today, pretty much with the, with the dock component and the uh, storage facility the two C cans, so um, it's basically been followed to a T on, on that original game plan. Um, and again, these licensed 
tend to be issued on a temporal basis, but um, Yukon typically renews them um, unless there's an issue. So it's, it's um, I just note that, you know, we have done these types of approvals in the same park context uh, in the past where it was um, a summer use. So there was a mountain biking company down the Long Lake Road in, the, in history that um, basically had the summer occupation of, of a license area, but then lease area, and then completely removed everything in the winter. Um, so there's different ways these can be managed, but again, there's, there's impacts to the society and logistical challenges with doing that, um, which, which often have to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Councillor Cameron. Uh, thank you, Chair. It, my second, uh, well, question this time is more around the matter of safety and security. And I worry a little bit about that notion of a five or six foot chain link fence as being somehow secure enough to protect what could be fairly expensive um, sailboats that will be inside that enclosure. Is there any exposure or liability that would rest with us if indeed um, that fencing is broken into and there's damage done to those uh, sailboats? We've obviously seen in recent history that there's been an escalation or increase in vandalism in our town and I, I worry about this as well. It's out of the way and if you've got a pretty expensive piece of um, sailing equipment in there, is it going to be sufficiently secure? Thank you. Certainly, um, I would suggest through the development permit process, the city would not inherit any liability. I would tend to look to the license agreement and just see what it says under the, the tenure arrangement, if there's anything that points to um, that requirement uh, through the land permitting process uh, through Yukon government. So. Thank you. Sorry, Your Worship. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question that I had is, um, and, and I and I did uh, sort of bring this up when the delegates uh, were here earlier this evening, is um, is in respect to the, um, the storage structure that the Yukon Canoe and Kayak uh, Club has um, down uh, at the um, Yukon River. There, um, what's what's the arrangement there? Who who owns that land? Uh, is it similar to here? Is it um, uh, commissioner's land? And yeah, do, do do you know that? Just curious. Um, to the chair, I believe that is an actual um, lease agreement through the city. It's it's a it's a waterfront reserve area, and um, my understanding is we've permitted that in a capacity. I just can't recall if it's actually a lease, but. Um, yeah, same situation though, though that it is a temporary use. And so we always shy away from permanent structure installations in those settings, um, recognizing it's, it's a temporal use scenario. So, but st different structures can be built on blocks and, um, and structurally sound in that regard. And, and then transport it away when they need to. It's it's just a little more involved, obviously, than a than a stock sea can arriving on a site. So a structure such as the Yukon Canoe and Kayak Club has could uh, be placed here. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Just one one last comment. It's on the engagement. Um, I'm just wondering um, uh, if we thought about um, sort of reaching out to specific stakeholders. So I'd, I think this is a big decision and I would hate for uh, public, uh, members of the public that would have wanted to um, provide input to miss this. So I'm, you know, I think about the, the various uh, mountain bike clubs, uh, hiking groups, um, definitely, um, uh, Riverdale Community Association, it's right in their backyard, and I'm wondering if we can um, do a little bit of targeting uh, just to inform them that this is coming before, uh, that the public input session is May 24th and it will be coming back to committee on June 20th. Is that something that we could do? 
Manager Ross. Through the chair, yeah, that's not typically part of our process to, to specifically target different groups. Um, we do have uh, processes where we we raise awareness of these things on our on our web page um, as as a conditional use application going to council, and then our standard advertising processes, but. Um, Certainly, we can we can um, do a quick list through any group that we ha have awareness of known use in that particular area, but that's, that could be pretty wide open. Um, so, but we'll definitely do our best to raise awareness. Thank you, thank you, Manager Ross, Councillor Cutanu. Thank you. Um, my apologies if it's in the report here, but it just wasn't clear to me. Is this a year-round lease or a seasonal lease? Uh, I believe it's on a five-year license of occupation through Yukon government. Um, so in, in that case, then, that they can keep the uh, sea cans year-round on the property. They don't have to be removing it. That's okay. correct, yeah. Thank you. Just what the, it goes with the term of the license. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before I go and pass the chair, um, I just want to check with councillors online if they have questions. Hearing none, I'll pass the chair to Councillor Laking so that I, let me speak a little bit. So taken. Over to you, Councillor Boyd. Thanks. Um, I see two concerns here. Um, but before I get into the two concerns, um, I would like to say that Yukon um, Breeze Sailing Society is, is fantastic that they're doing, that they're there and that they do the, the work they do. And it's, uh, it's great programming. Um, I would like to see us do everything we possibly can to, uh, to support that and to encourage them forward. Um, but that said, I think we have a, a real problem with the um, bit of a collide with these shipping containers that are placed on the Yukon Riverbanks, Schwatka Lake Riverbanks, um, and how to create something that will serve them well and help them with the programming they're trying to do, but yet also show show well in our community. So I don't know if there's an opportunity where um, the development officers could work a little bit more with them to try to come up with ways and ideas to do that. Um, I believe what we've got in front of us is just a, a simple reapplication of more containers uh, placed on the property. And I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned that, well, it won't be horrible. It's not going to be very really nice either. Um, and I know we're already, people are aware of this and we're already getting concerns, not about what they do. They, people love the programming. It's about what this might look like and the precedent, it's, it's moving along. And then the, the second part of the concern is trying to reconcile this with the other side of the lake where we don't allow the shipping containers. Um, and it's very difficult to be talking to, with those businesses that are um, push, you know, trying to move our economy along um, to be having a different standard altogether um, with them. So um, I don't know that we're going to reconcile that collide um, through this process, but I would at the very least like to um, see this uh, as a fairly attractive um, site, both from the water and from the road and people in the area. So I personally have some ideas, but I don't think that's, <laughs> my ideas are that important. I think just trying to figure out um, what could, how could the city work with this group to try to come up with something that's um, quite presentable in the community and that the community would, would welcome. That's my, my feeling on it. I'll take the chair back. Yeah, back to you. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, any Further discussion tonight, um, is this ready to go to council? 
next week. This does need to go to council. This will come back next, this yeah. coming Monday for public input session. Right. Yeah. So. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Murray, um, is there, so there's two, uh, just for clarification, there's two secans already on site. Uh, I understand they're painted green or they came green for aesthetic reasons, but then there's suggestions uh, on having them painted. Uh, wouldn't a delegate team in to have maybe artwork, have, uh, have you paint some artwork on there? Would there be parameters around the current secans that are on site right now? Councilor, sorry, my manager Ross. And sorry, I, I just missed that last part. Um, I, I know it was in regard to painting of the cans, but what was the last part of your question? The, the second part was, would this, whatever we come up with, would it be applied to the existing C cans or would they, we would treat the old, the ones that are already in place uh, separately? Yeah, the, well, they, they have been permitted under previous um, process. Of, of course, we can always work with the, um, the applicant um, through this process and I'm sure if we came up with some kind of game plan for treatment that um, felt was a better solution and more palatable to the community, if we're hearing a lot of input from the public, um, I'm sure open to ideas. And that's the purpose of this process is to address these types of issues that may come up and then just work towards finding solutions that are uh, agreeable to the parties and help mitigate those issues in the eyes of the public. Okay, if there's no further questions, this can come, uh, this will be coming back uh, next week and public input um, is next week as well. Do I stand corrected? Uh, um, just a process clarity here. These conditional use applications aren't something that council often sees. So this report and the next report are both for information only reports and they're existing for the purpose of briefing council on the nature of the application and letting council know that the public input hearing will be next week. So when they, so they, they don't come forward for an active decision from council next week. They're on the agenda for public input at the council meeting. Okay, that's helpful, but so ultimately is there a council decision here or is there's public input and the administration will do with that public input as it sees fit? This is uh, feels a little awkward, but uh, your worship. That's, that's correct. Um, council decision comes on June 27th. Okay, so we do have council decision on this matter in the future. No, that's fine. It, it, timing is one thing, but I was misunderstanding the city manager's point. I, for a minute, thought this, there was no council decision on this, which was awkward. But there is a council decision in June, later in June, on this um, on this application, so all good. Thank you very much, um, Manager Ross. Um, with that, I think we're good to go on to the uh, next item, which is conditional use application 44A Stopeway. It's and again, it's for information only. Manager Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, another conditional use application coming for Council's uh, review. And this report um, deals with a conditional use that is um, a home-based business major located at 44A Stope Way. So the residence at 44A Stope Way consists of a one dwelling contained within a side-by-side -side duplex. And this, uh, this is a subdivided development into a two-unit condominium corporation. The home-based business major classification is required in this case in order to operate out of an attached garage of one of the duplex units. The uh, proposed business activity from the garage space is for the packaging of coffee beans for distribution to various retail locations and shops around Whitehorse. 
The coffee beans are associated with the Fire Bean Coffee Roasters business, which is owned by the residents and owners of 44A Stopeway. Notice the application was made on May 6, 2022, with public input session being scheduled for the May 24th, 2022 regular council meeting coming up. Major home-based businesses are classified as conditional use in the RS zone due to their potential to create off-site impacts through the activity that could affect the quiet enjoyment of the surrounding neighbors. With the exception of the additional traffic incurred through the delivery and pickup of the coffee beans to the residents, no additional off-site impacts are anticipated through this development proposal. As noted in the report before you, allowing for the home-based business is part of building a diverse economy in the city through the city's community economic development strategy. And therefore, the public input session is scheduled in accordance with section 4.8 of Zoning Bylaw 2012-20, scheduled for May 24th, 2022. A total of 64 letters were sent to property owners within a 100 meter radius of the site. Governor Yukon, Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, and the Ta'an Kwachin Council were also notified by mail and email. And a notice of the proposed development was placed in local newspapers again on May 6, 2022. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Manager Ross. Uh, questions from Council? Councillor Cameron. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a quick one about the increased flow of traffic uh, on, in the area. Um, I know my coffee consumption, so I'm thinking you probably need an extra semi-tractor trailer to go in there to pick up all the coffee that I would need. But are we talking about a small vehicle back and forth a couple times a day or like just how much traffic increase might that look like? Yeah, in discussions with the proponent, the, um, the first one, um, yeah, may, maybe a cube van, um, but yeah, certainly not the big heavy truck traffic. That, that would not be acceptable in a residential neighborhood. So um, yeah, and it's something, of course, in these situations we monitor because as businesses are more successful, the activity tends to increase. So we always have those cautionary discussions up front about what we consider an acceptable um, level of activity. You, you can have up to two clients at a time coming to the site in a home-based business major setting like this, and you can have one non-resident employed on the site. So there are some higher tolerances associated with a home-based business major classification, and, um, but don't anticipate any significant off-site impacts here. Thank you. Councillor Lakin. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and thank you, Manager Ross, for the presentation. And follow up to uh, Councillor Cameron's query. Um, do we know if, if they're anticipating to store uh, this equipment, such as the, the cube van, uh, on site? Or like would this start to more resemble uh, an industrial lot rather than a residential lot? Thank you. Uh, there, there is really no room on the site other than the two residential parking spots that'll be um, in the in the front driveway. But uh, no, we're we're anticipating there won't be a um, vehicle used by the owners for this purpose. It'll be delivery vans and coming and going delivering. The um, roasting operation for this for this business, my understanding, is outside city limits. So the roasting happens in another location, and then the beans are delivered to this for packaging and distribution, essentially. Thank you. Further questions? Councillors on the phone? Quick check-in. Okay, hearing none. Um, this, is, this is good and ready to move on to Council. Thank you very much, uh, Manager Ross. And next item is new business. Is there any new business for the City Planning Committee? Hearing none, Your Worship, I turn it back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Boyd. Uh, Development Service Committee is up next. Councillor Cretania, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, two items on the agenda tonight for the Development Services Committee. I believe Manager Ross will be presenting the first one, which is the amendments to pop-up patio program. Thank you, Madam Chair. So administration is bringing forward a few amendments to the lease encroachment and properties policy 
To complement the two amendments passed by Council last week under Resolution 2022-09-09, these amendments being the allowance for the 1.8 patio limit in the par parallel parking stall scenarios and the prohibition of parking patios on 2nd and 4th Avenues. Uh, the administration proposed amendments include in this round the addition of a map to the policy that clearly shows where pop-up parking patios are permitted in the downtown area and the addition of more criteria for separation distances of patios to street infrastructure such as fire hydrants, water valves and storm drain inlets and from street intersections, uh, lanes and driveways and also the requirement for a reflective object marker sign on the side of the patio facing oncoming traffic. So these are just little adjustments we're making as we get more into the permitting of these um, and learn more about criteria we want to establish. In addition to the policy amendments being proposed, administration has been in discussions with Yukon government over the winter regarding possible grant funding to support sidewalk and pop-up patio initiatives in the city's downtown area. This has resulted in a draft transfer payment agreement, or TPA, which has now been received from Yukon for the amount of 150000 to support sidewalk and pop-up patio initiatives in the 200, 2022 permitting season. The TPA contemplates the City of Whitehorse as the fund administrator. Sidewalk and pop-up patios approved in the 2022 season will be eligible to submit expenses noted within the TPA. Expenses submitted will be reviewed by administration and brought forward at year end under the umbrella grant process for formal council authorization. It is anticipated that each sidewalk and pop-up patio initiative will have a funding ceiling or cap which is designed to ensure fair opportunity and access to the funds. If the proposed granting program is adopted by council, administration will advertise the program to the public and contact the current 2022 applicants to notify them of, their, um, of the program and their eligibility. So the administrative recommendation for this report is that council direct that amendments to section 2.10 of the lease encroachment and properties policy be brought forward for approval and that council adopt the pop-up parking patio and sidewalk cafe proposed granting program. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Manager Ross. Oh. Oh. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I looked that way out of, that was my fault. I set him up. Um, I think I'll, I'll go to the phones first. Uh, Councillors Friesen and Murray, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none. Anyone in the room? Councillor Laking? Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for this presentation um, and our, our weekly briefing on pop-up patios. <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, with respect to the changes for the, the district map, um, which I know just sort of visualizes the decision we made last week is my understanding, but also the, you know, the additions of the separations from street infrastructure. Does this um, have any impacts on any existing uh, pop-up patios or any of those that are currently going through an application process? Thank you. No, no impacts to anything on the go at this time. Follow up? Um, <clears throat> only to say that this, this TPA agreement is, I mean, this addresses a lot of our concerns that we had around the costs associated with construction and insurance. Um, I realize and recognize that administrations m moved heaven and earth on this file uh, over the last several months and it's really appreciated to see how far we've we've moved on this and I, I'm really looking forward to a good pop-up patio season here in Whitehorse. I think this is just great and it's it's one of those times when uh, you, f you feel like you're making some change uh, sitting in a seat. So thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cameron, please. Just very quickly to echo 
uh, Deputy Mayor Laking's observation. I was also quite delighted to see this agreement in place. It's uh, it's very helpful. I particularly like the fact that the, the the one item that seemed to be the straw that was breaking the camel's back with the business community, the liability insurance, is included as one of the eligible expenses. So that, to me, is a big step forward. So thank you very much, administration. Councillor Boyd. Um, thank you. And just to build on that, um, big uh, thank you to the Yukon government for uh, coming through with some help for this program. I um, was pleasantly surprised when I read this late last week that this was actually going to happen because I my bones were telling me it wasn't going to happen. So that's um, it, it's great, and I do want to extend to City Whitehorse's appreciation for that. Um, my second comment, though, it's in a question, is is the city um, ready and able to quickly administer this program? Have we thought it through, have a plan, and um, are going to be able to, uh, to deliver quickly with full accountability as Yukon government requires? <laughs> Adger Ross. Yes, um, we, we're in motion already on trying to basically, um, luckily we can treat it very similar to a development incentive application. Um, so it's, it's basically, uh, we're trying to make it a very short application that you place as you bring forward your development application for the patio or sidewalk uh, initiative. So um, that, that uh, documents that the application is on the table and then once things are permitted and out the door, then it's just a question of the applicants collecting their different expense receipts and submitting them to us. And no rush on that, because this will be an end of year um, uh, grant that's issued. So we'll, we'll collect those um, through our ECDEV section uh, at the city or the, um, with the planning and sustainability group. And most of the criteria and what's eligible for expenses is laid out in the transfer payment agreement. Um, we just have to just add, add a little criteria on, again, a, uh, a cap on the funding for each project and, and a few other minor things and uh, make sure the application form is completed. But um, we're, we're close to being ready to do that. And again, since the funding is retroactive, um, Nobody will miss out this year just because they happen to have got a jump on the season. And, and, and we are currently working on trying to um, embed a criteria for uh, 15 degrees or higher in the weather that goes with these patios. So we haven't quite figured that one out, but we need weather. Something further, Councillor Boyd? Yeah. So. Um, I take it the money is not, it has to be spent this year and it's not available for next year, even if we have surplus, or if we have surplus in the fund, do we just return it? Or, um, and likewise, if we have oversubscription, we have a way to limit it to the 150, fairly limit it to the, to the 150? Yeah, that's correct, Madam Chair. Our, we're anticipating as we will, have a cap on each funding, which will translate to a total number of applications um, coming through the door. If we exceed that, we'll be notifying um, applications beyond that, that they can still apply, but depending on how the first applications through the door um, play out in terms of um, what is awarded to them, there may or may not be funding available, but it'll be a first come, first serve basis. And it's a one year season. For this, for this funding opportunity. So yeah, at the end of the season, what's not used goes back to Yukon government. Okay, uh, anything more on this? Okay, seeing none, this will be coming forward next week. Thank you, Manager Ross. Uh, the second item is new business. Is there any new business for the Development Services Committee? Councillor Friesen or Councillor Murray? Okay, hearing none, the chair's back to you, Your Worship. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, next committee is the City Operations Committee, so I'll pass the chair to Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, Your Worship. There's uh, one item on the City Operations Committee this evening. It's new business. 
Is there any new business? Uh, Councillor Murray or Councillor Friesing, do you have any new business for the City Operations Committee? Hearing none, I uh, conclude my uh, committee and pass the chair back to you, Your Worship. Thank you. Over to the Community Services uh, Committee. Uh, who's the vice chair for that one? Councillor Cameron? Uh, actually, I believe it is uh, the other missing councillor. So I'm going to ask you, uh, or I'm going to ask the Deputy Mayor, please, to chair the final um, item, please. Thank you, Your Worship. The Community Service Committee has one item on the agenda this evening. It's new business. Uh, look around the room. Is there any new business? Uh, I will go to the phone. Is Hi. there? Oh, Councillor Murray, uh, please go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, I have one uh, new business, and it's just to uh, recognize and highlight that um, most, most of the councillors attended the Association of Yukon Communities 47th Annual General Meeting uh, and Conference on May 13th and 14th um, in Whitehorse. Um, there was presentations and workshops by RPA, Recreation and Park Association of Yukon, by Ann Morgan and Roger Bauer. There was also a presentation by uh, Taya Yukon, um, by Blake Rogers. Uh, there was a presentation by IRP, Inspire Reconciliation Potential, by Davida Wood and Tosh Southwick about reconciliation and indigenization. There was also a uh, workshop about from Elevator Yukon, which is led by John Glenn Morris on policy. And I do want to recognize that at the AGM, we have three new newly elected officials, elected executives uh, as part of AYC. And I want to congratulate our own uh, Deputy Mayor, Ted Laking, as uh, elected as president. Um, Lauren Hanshar was elected as first vice president, uh, who is the Town of Watson Lake Councillor and Doris Hansen, who is elected as the second vice president, um, and she is the village of Carmack's counselor. Um, and it's great to see everyone in person and looking forward to the next year in Watson Lake. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Murray. Um, is there any further new business? Seeing none, I will conclude the Community Services Committee and I will pass it back to you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much, and that concludes the agenda of the Standing Committee of uh, May 16th, so I will um, call the meeting adjourned.